Jess, for those who don't, don't know me, I'm actually a physician. I'm not a gynecologist um, and I've also got a pathology degree. So I'm quite geeky. I'm into basic science as well as um, I was a hospital physician for quite a few years and then I pivoted into general practice for many years. And now, as Bev knows, all I do is think about hormones um, and the perimenopause and menopause. And all I do is talk about it as well, actually. Um, so it's important because it affects so many people. So just for complete transparency, I don't have any financial disclosures. I don't do any paid work with any pharmaceutical companies or with any companies at all, um, but I do take HRT. And I think that's important to be open about about that because without HRT I actually wouldn't be working as a doctor my brain had gone my memory had gone my mood my temper had gone as well and my migraines had come back with a vengeance um, so I was really struggling and I only work part-time as a GP because I'm also a medical writer um, so going having flexible working or reducing my hours was really not an option um, and actually I really struggle and I still do to get HRT on the NHS because I'm told it's too risky and I'm a fit um, healthy uh, middle class woman who speaks English as my first language so as Bev was alluding to I spend a lot of my time thinking about how to reach women who aren't so fortunate as me to able to get the right information so they can make the right choices for their future health. So it's always good to focus on the patient. So this is a patient who wasn't called Claire and didn't look like this, but it's just to home in about people. Um, so this is a lady, 51 year old lady, who just felt dreadful. There's lots of us that feel dreadful various times of maybe the day or month, depending on our circumstances, but she felt dreadful most of the time. She had um, less energy than she used to have and just felt more tired. Her migraines were getting worse and she had a history of premenstrual migraine with aura and the with aura bit's important because that means there's um, a, a stroke risk only really small but there's an increased risk with women um, so she was seen in a migraine clinic and she was had first line treatments from her gp didn't help so she was tried on various other medication and as many as you know this is given completely off license it's an anti-epileptic medication to try for prophylaxis sometimes works with people didn't work with her because caused horrendous side effects. And I'm not surprised because these are heavy duty drugs for gabapentin, topiramate and gabapentin. So she couldn't tolerate them because of the side effects. She also experienced numerous urinary tract infections, needed antibiotics, had urinary symptoms. So was getting up in the night to pass urine, had a bit of stress but she put that down to being um, over 50 and thought that was normal because a lot of her friends were experiencing those symptoms. She also had some occasional palpitations, which were a concern because she had a family history of cardiovascular disease. Both her brother and her father had died under the age of 50 from heart attacks. And she had a clot. Um, she had a DVT after a long, long uh, flight five years ago. She had a family history of clots. So she was, when she was investigated after the DVT, she was found, found to have factor five Leiden deficiency. So reviewing her medical notes, actually for all these symptoms, she'd seen numerous different specialists, both in primary and secondary care, and had many investigations. And this is not just um, sort of time wasting and money wasting for primary and secondary care, but it also meant she had to leave her job for all these investigations and her employers were getting a bit hacked off. Um, she had all these tests and she saw various um, specialists, but she was told her investigations were normal. Well, they weren't normal to her because she was still experiencing real symptoms. And um, people just said, well, there's no reason for it there's no pathological reason for it and um, this is a real problem not just in menopause but for all sorts of things where people are not listened to or believed and it's very real actually it really happens um, so no underlying cause found so she saw another doctor who asked her a few more questions and she admitted that she was more anxious than she used to be. And when she wasn't waking up in the night to go for a wee, she was still waking up, not feeling um, able to get back to sleep very easily. She admitted to being more irritable at times. Her mood was lower, some early morning awakening. And so she was um, not on. Uh, she, you know, it's not without reason really diagnosed with clinical depression and she was given some citalopram, quite a common antidepressant SSRI. Didn't really help her, she just felt it blunted her affect, but she was too scared to stop it in case she felt worse. Um, then she saw another doctor who asked her a few more direct questions, really thinking about her, her date of birth, don't forget she was 51. 
So I said to her, are you still having periods? And she said, oh yeah, they stopped 13 months ago, but I'm not here to talk about my periods. I'm here to talk about all my symptoms that are really impacting the quality of my life. And then the doctor said, well, are you having any hot flushes? Well, yeah, only about eight a day, not many. My sister um, has 20 a day and my uh, best friend has about 30. So again, nothing to complain about. She said, well, when you're not sleeping well, have you ever had night sweats? She said, yes, I get the most nights. I often sleep on a towel, but it really doesn't bother me at all. And then being more direct, asked her about any vaginal dryness and irritation, knowing that she had all these urinary symptoms. And she said, yes, I do actually, it's quite uncomfortable. I've stopped wearing jeans, I've stopped cycling, even wearing swimming costumes, but, um, not very pleasant. And sitting down for long periods of time, I'm very aware of my vulva and around the surrounding area. So I, I really look at what chair I sit down on, but I think that's just normal because I'm getting older now. Um, she didn't have much sex actually, but when she did, she always had a urinary tract infection straight after and she did say that she was never going for a smear again because her last one was so uncomfortable and painful she actually said her libido was very low she um, even described that she would prefer to drink toilet water than have sex with her husband and she said I still love my husband I, I adore him but there's just nothing on nothing um, nothing no lights go on below my waist I'm really not interested in sex at all and it, it's difficult it comes between us as a as a as, as a partner. So what's the diagnosis? Well, clearly I'm not here to talk about anything other than the menopause. She is menopausal because it's 13 months since her last period. And what should she be prescribed? Well, she should be prescribed exactly what she wants. All my work is done out of two big guidelines, actually, the menopause nice guidance, but also the shared decision-making guidance. And I spend a lot of time talking to women and, and exploring what they want um, with the knowledge that they have. But if we look back about the history of the menopause, clearly it's spoken about a long time when Bev and I first met, it wasn't really spoken about in the media. And now every other paper or article has menopause on, which delights me. It frustrates lots of other people I know. But we need to think the average, not that any woman's average age of the menopause is 51. Um, but younger women can be menopausal as well. We've always quoted one in a hundred, but a recent study said about three in a hundred women under the age of 40 have an early menopause. I heard this morning that about 20 in a hundred women living with HIV under the age of 40 have are menopausal. My youngest patient's 14. Her ovaries never developed. She never had periods. I've got many women who were teenagers when they were diagnosed as menopausal. And it's bad enough being a 50 year old woman who's, who's menopausal, but I can't imagine what it must be like when you can't concentrate in double maths because you've got brain fog or you can't sit down for double maths because you've got vaginal dryness. And who do you talk to about that? So we know the life expectancy is a lot better than it used to be. So many of us will live decades um, being menopausal. And around a third of our lives potentially will be postmenopausal. And this is important because even if we don't have symptoms, we still have low hormones and these do have effects in our body. So thinking about it as a hormone deficiency with health risks is important to focus our mind and think about our hormones as something that don't just cause symptoms when we don't have them, but they're biologically active hormones in our body, estrogen, progesterone and testosterone. Very important. We have receptors for uh, these hormones in cells all over our bodies as women. They're designed to function and or improve the function of our, of our health and our bodies. So um, lots of us are affected, obviously, all women directly and men indirectly. I can't think of a man that doesn't know a woman. And most of us will have symptoms. Um, some studies say 25% have severe symptoms. I don't know how we define severe, but I think it's a lot more than that. A lot of women I speak to say, I have no symptoms. And then you ask them about their sleep, ask them if they have any muscle and joint pains, ask them if they have any urinary symptoms. Oh, yes, but that's due to my age. And it's probably related to their hormones. They're not realizing it. But then because the menopause affects us um, um, every woman it's thought of as not a not a disease nothing that we should pester a doctor about so a lot of people are not going to see a healthcare a professional and even this even though a lot of us um, experience symptoms that are a lot worse than they were expecting 
I've already said that estrogen affects every cell in our body, and I'm not going to read this out, but if you think about every system it, it affects, then you quite quickly realize um, how many symptoms that there can be when the hormones are low. And I'm particularly interested in the, um, the neurotransmitting properties of estradiol and testosterone, how it can work in our brains. We shouldn't be thinking of the menopause as just something defined by menstruation or not, or fertility or not. It's more about a cognitive disorder, actually. And, um, and that's really crucial when we think about not just the physical symptoms, but the psychological symptoms as well. There's a huge number of symptoms that people can have. So then we need to think about the psychological symptoms of the menopause. So the anxiety, the irritability, the panic attacks, the low confidence. 98% of women I see in my clinic or, or come to my clinic have psychological symptoms. And then there are risks to health as well. So it's quite doom and gloom being a menopausal woman. So osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, obesity, clinical depression, all increase because the menopause is a cardiometabolic problem. Uh, problem. We have this big shift in our metabolism without um, estradiol and, and this can lead to all sorts of problems. So we need to think of the menopause actually as an opportunity. It is doom and gloom for us, um, but actually it can be really positive. Um, and I, I really strongly feel that we could we can become the best version of ourselves when we're menopausal if we were given the right advice and treatment. And we need to be looking at not just whether we're on hormones or not, we need to be looking at our, our diet, our nutrition, we need to be looking at um, exercise, ways of improving our sleep, ways of improving our mood and our happiness as well. It all works together and all our hormones work together. Our sex hormones don't work in isolation with our stress hormones, for example, or our, or our thyroid hormones and or our serotonin. It's really Really important that we look all together. Um, as a medical writer, I've written a huge amount of patient information, so booklets, videos, I do a weekly podcast that's now had nearly 4 million downloads, um, and articles as well, and we're constantly adding to make resources freely available to people globally, as well as through the Balance app as well. So there's no clinical um, biochemical diagnosis for the perimenopause and menopause. It's more of symptoms. And this is a menopause symptom questionnaire we use for all our patients in the clinic and it's on the app as well. And clearly these symptoms can be due to many things, but if they occur in people and their periods are changing in nature or frequency or their periods are stopped, or there's no other explanation for these symptoms, then we need to be thinking about hormones a lot of women have some hormonal changes a day or two before their periods, and they're very similar to those symptoms that occur during the perimenopause and menopause. And women actually aren't stupid. So often asking women, giving them information, saying, do you think any of these symptoms could be due to your hormones? And I wish I'd thought of that question uh, for the first 30 years of my medical career, because I would have helped women in We've got good guidelines that we can work out of. They're, they're quite old now. And when the NICE guidance came out in 2015, I was very excited because I thought, great, more women will get HRT. This is going to be wonderful because the take home message is the majority of women, HRT provides more benefits and risks. Seven years later, we've gone from 10% of menopausal women to about 14% of menopausal women receiving HRT. HRT and we've got a, a shortage of HRT and people telling us we're over prescribing HRT so um, I'm not a mathematician but 14% is not the majority. So summary of guidance, everything we do, and even just coming on to the, the last end of the last speaker, individualized care is so important. I feel I'm here as a patient's advocate. I'm not a dictator. I'm not telling them what they can and can't do or what they should and shouldn't have or um, forcing them to have a certain prescription. It's about individualization of care. And that's very important in menopause care as well. We need to talk about benefits as well as risks of HRT so they can make an appropriate treatment choice knowing that the, the benefits outweigh the risks for most women. And women can usually take HRT forever to replace their missing hormones that will be low forever. And also, obviously, we need to think about lifestyle as well. And I've already said the minority of women still take HRT and in areas of social deprivation, it's as low as two or 3% of women who take HRT. 
So there are benefits. When we think about HRT, even coming to this conference um, in Florence, it's always HRT and breast cancer. It's not HRT. We've, we've, I've had so many lectures about the, the, the risks of HRT that aren't really there, but no one's really talking about the benefits. Of course, there are benefits of having our hormones back, especially in young women, but in older women too, when we think about all the diseases associated with the menopause. But the most important thing actually is it can make people feel better. And as a clinician, I feel very responsible for helping people, for helping them feel better, improve their well-being. And actually, if you're treating an underlying cause, it's a lot better to do that than put a sticking plaster on them. Um, most people we see have been given antidepressants um, for their low mood associated with their menopause. It doesn't really help them. It just makes them feel a bit flat. But actually to have something that can improve most if not all of their symptoms is transformational medicine but also as a physician I want to reduce disease I want to keep people away from doctors and um, I'm really interested in um, longevity and inflammaging and so we know all these inflammatory conditions reduce because estradiol is very anti-inflammatory in our body um, so knowing that women who take HRT have a lower risk of these diseases D dementia the jury is still out but it makes sense if you just think that lots of data show that the longer a woman is at without her hormones the greater the risk of dementia it does make sense that putting back hormones will reduce that risk but when we try and prescribe HRT, we get told about risks. And I'm here, obviously, to talk about clot. And suddenly it says it's a contraindication if they've got active or history of VTE or thrombophilic disorders. And there's a warning if there's even a predisposition. So if you've got a family history, it should be a warning. Now, this is even if I try and prescribe vaginal estrogen. And this is this I've, I've printed out from estrogel, which is transdermal estrogen. And so I'm not surprised that people are scared. And it's not just when we prescribe as clinicians, when women, when I open my patches twice a week, the packet to get my patches of, of estradiol out, it's exactly the same warnings for me as a patient. And of course, I'm going to be scared if I don't know the facts and the science. So if we think about VTE in women, we know the instance increases in age of clot. Of course it does. And there are various risk factors for clot. So someone who has had a history is going to increase their risk. We know obesity, which is increasing in a hugely scary way, um, not just in the UK, but globally. In inherited throm thrombophilias, we know that oral contraceptives are, and oral HRT, and when I say oral HRT, I mean synthetic hormones. So the conjugated equine estrogens, the synthetic progestogens, which I'll talk about more in a minute, are actually contraindicated for women with a high risk of VTE. So oral estrogen, the risk of VTE varies and what you read, a lot of people say it's around double or um, it could even be higher. Double risk sounds a lot, but for many women, their risk of a clot is low. So doubling a low risk is still a low risk, but it's still a risk that's there. And the risk seems to be great as the first year. So if you've got through your first year of taking HRT, you're probably going to be all right. And that seems similar with the oral contraceptives as well. So we usually use transdermal estrogen. I have, um, I actually, I can't think of a patient who's on a older type of HRT. I've got a few who are on the body identical oral estrogen, which doesn't seem to have a, have a clot associated with it. But with transdermal estrogen, I'll talk about it a bit more in a minute, but the risk of ET is not increased. In fact, the odds ratio, when you put the studies together is 0 0.9. And I think it it's actually associated with a lower risk of clot, and I'd prefer, would really love to do some studies that show that women who take HRT have a lower risk of clot compared to the natural population. And we're doing a study with Beverly um, Hunt, actually, just every single patient we see, we ask them if they've had a clot in the last year. And uh, my poor clinicians who work with me aren't able to save the records until they've answered that question. We see around 4,000 perimenopausal and menopausal women a month through my clinic. So times that by 12 over a year, we're gonna have a lot of data showing hopefully that women don't really have clots when they're on HRT. Vaginal estrogens as well, very local. We use vaginal estrogens either with or without systemic HRT. They can be transformational for women who have localized symptoms and they don't get absorbed into the body. The dose is incredibly low. So how can they increase risk? Because they don't get absorbed systemically. So there's oral or the transdermal estrogen 
We know that oral estrogen, everyone says it leads to higher levels of estrogen in the liver, which um, activates uh, liver clotting factors, impairs protein synthesis, including making um, a hypercoagulable state and reduces antithrombin levels and activates the co co coagulation cascade. It's thought to also induce a resistance to activated protein C as well. So um, this effect seems to be the direct effect of the oral estrogen when it's metabolized into the liver. Transdermal estrogen obviously just sticks or gets rubbed into the skin, goes straight into the bloodstream. So it doesn't have this big effect in the liver. We know that even low dose oral estrogen seems to still have this clotting effect as well, uh, especially as I said, this is a horse's urine um, estrogens, which we'd be pleased to hear we don't prescribe anymore. Um, so when you look at the studies, there's various studies. The WHI is the big randomized control study, probably the only randomized control study that's ever going to be done now on, on, on women. Um, and that was looking at women taking the conjugated equine estrogen and then a synthetic progestogen. And you can see all of these studies there was an increased risk what I think is very interesting is that the relative risk for, the, for estrogen only so women who've had a hysterectomy the relative risk was only 1.3 but when you add in a synthetic progestion it went up to 2.1 we always talk about estrogen being the baddie with HRT actually estrogen is really safe and even the WHI looking at estrogen only HRT following women up for 20 years they had a 22% lower incidence of being diagnosed with breast cancer. So um, still a low, because the, the, when you look at the absolute risk, it was low, but it was a reduction. Whereas there was a small increase in women of breast cancer in women who took estrogen with a synthetic progestogen. Not statistically significant, but that's what put the nail in the coffin for HRT. So estrogen is actually good, probably for clot, good for breast cancer. So it, they're, they're the two reasons why people don't take HRT, because they're worried about breast cancer and they're worried about clot. So this is uh, the, the ester study, and it's looking oral compared to transdermal. And you'll see that uh, the odds ratio higher with oral, this is menopausal hormonal therapy, same as HRT, increased transdermal again, just below the line, so probably beneficial. And then this is probably the, the best review, really, looking, it was a nested case control study, so, um, looking at the difference between um, and uh, of oral and transdermal. And actually, when this uh, study came out in 2018, it hit the headline saying increased risk of clot with HRT. What it didn't say is it, um, lower risk or no risk of, H of clot with transdermal HRT. Everyone just wants to sensationalize about how potentially bad HRT is. So this was the, uh, the study from the group in Oxford and they use UK um, research uh, databases. And there was a lot of people in there, 80,000 women who developed clots and HRT tablets was associated with a higher risk, which is what was expected from other studies. But if you look at this table, I've just indicated, I think the most important bit really, is looking at transdermal estrogen. And again, estradiol goes below the line, um, or it's just around the line, depending on what your BMI is. Um, but combined estradiol, so that's with a synthetic progestogen, if you look in the middle column, the BMI between 25 and 30, it seems to sneak up. It goes down again uh, when women are uh, more obese, not really sure why. Um, but all the other types of HRT with these synthetic progestogens increases risk of clot. So of course we would never prescribe. So we know that the transdermal preparations were not associated with the risk of, of clot, 95% confidence indicate, interval and odds ratio 0.93. There has been some work, and I put the references at the bottom, again, not great studies, but again, um, no significant increase in women with um, factor five laden mutations. There is a 25 fold increased risk with oral estrogens, 25 fold increased risk of clot, but there didn't seem to be an increase. But again, if you think logically of how these transdermal estrogens work, it's no surprise because all we're doing is replacing the missing hormones. And so these women with factor V Leiden or other mutations don't have an increased risk because they've got their 
ovaries working compared to those women who've had an oophorectomy, for example. We don't worry about their natural hormones. And so giving back hormones just naturally in physiological doses, it just doesn't make sense that it would increase risk. So the optimal HRT that we prescribe usually is transdermal estrogen, so a patch or gel um, with the natural micronized progesterone. And we've produced an easy HRT prescribing because it really can be easy, um, giving women the choice between patches and gel. There's a spray, but it often doesn't get absorbed very well. Um, reassuring them about the VTE risk and even women with a history of VTE, we, we know that their risk of a clot is going to increase because of their background risk or their whatever their history is, but giving HRT isn't going to increase their risk further. Um, we also know that transdermal estrogen doesn't affect SHBG, which um, oral estrogen does, it increases SHBG, which then can reduce libido as well. So the nice guidance say consider transdermal estrogen for these women, but we offer it to all women actually because I don't see the point of increasing a risk of anything to somebody if there's a safer alternative in medicine. So the progestogens, they're the ones that are the, they're, they're just synthetically, they've, they've been made slightly differently to the natural progesterone. They're in all the oral contraceptives, they're in the combined oral contraceptives, they're in the uh, progesterone only pill, they're in the implants, they're in the marina coil, but the marina is different because it only works locally on the womb. But if you look at the risk of VTE, it does increase in women who use estrogen with synthetic progestogens compared to estrogen only, as I've said. And the risk really does vary. If you look at charts, looking at different types of progesterone, then the risk does vary. So we use micronized progesterone, and this isn't just a, a plant from my garden, this is a yam plant that they're derived from. And what they do is they micronize it, so they make the particles very, very small and suspend them in oil, so therefore it, you can, they can be easily digested and absorbed into the body. It, um, and they, they are the exact uh, replica of the progesterone we produce from our ovaries when we're younger. Um, <clears throat> so we call them body identical, really. So they're very different by metabolically and biologically compared to synthetic progestogens, as you would expect. It's good news, actually, because they can improve the cardiovascular risk and <coughs> excuse me, they can have a neutral but probably beneficial effect on blood pressure. And what's important for this presentation, of course, they have no VTE risk. Also, what's really important when people worry about HRT is they've not shown to be having an increased risk of breast cancer and they have less side effects. At the minute, there's a shortage of progesterone because the prescribing's increased because they're safe, but hopefully that will only be a short-term problem. I just wanted to mention before I finish about genital urinary syndrome of the menopause, GSM. It used to be called vulvovaginal atrophy, but if you look up the uh, in the dictionary, the term atrophy, the description is withering and wasting away. Well, I don't want to be thought of a woman who's withering and wasting away. So genital urinary syndrome of the menopause is nicer to describe, but also it's the urinary symptoms that are affected, um, like I've said before. And it's due to low, not just low estrogen, actually, but testosterone. We've got testosterone receptors all around our vulva, vagina, perineum and urinary tract as well. And the symptoms can be numerous. Very common affects around 80% of menopausal women. Studies show around 8% receive treatment. So there's a lot of women out there who are experiencing symptoms in silence. And it won't improve. Hot flushes might only last seven years, 10 years, but actually these symptoms are progressive and they will continue without treatment. And we've written a consensus statement with the British Society of uh, Sexual Medicine, which is freely available online, discussing this in detail. And there are lots of different treatment, vaginal um, tablets, there's a ring, there's a pessary, there's creams, there's gels. Sometimes we use a combination, an intrarosa, which is DHEA, which converts to estradiol and testosterone in the vagina, daily pessary, which can be transformational, especially for women with urinary symptoms. We've written some patient information on clots on the website, we've done podcasts, and I think it's very interesting when I was hearing about um, stopping trans people um, before surgery, which I think is awful, actually. I would never want to stop my HRT, and if I forgot, forget to change my patches, I get joint pain and migraines, and so um, we know that there isn't a risk of clots. So if women or, or trans people are on transdermal estrogen, then they shouldn't be stopping their... Um, their HRT before they have surgery uh, because it's not going to make any difference. 
So we wrote the uh, booklet with Thrombosis UK on menopause and clots as well. And we put references throughout it to reassure not just people reading it, but also clinicians that are shown to it as well. So just going back to Claire, the patient that I described, she was given some transdermal estrogen and micronized progesterone continually to try and mean that her periods didn't restart. And she was given some localized estrogen as well. Her migraines improved, but also so did her other symptoms. And it's very, I love doing my clinical work because I also know it's very rewarding knowing that I'm improving her future health as well. So she said, I've regained my energy levels and joined a gym. I can go through the day without feeling like I am going to fall over with exhaustion. And it's very important, especially if you think about clot, she's exercising more. She'll probably not put on weight. Her lifestyle will be better. So her overall risk of clot will probably reduce by taking a treatment that doesn't increase her risk of clot. Um, but it, it's very important when you think about what are we doing by denying people. And a lot of the work we're doing is thinking about what are the risks of not taking HRT rather than the risks of taking HRT. Um, so just finally, some take home message. Individualized care is important. There are many, many symptoms of the menopause and there are health risks as well. And most types of HRT are safe, providing more benefits than risks. And hopefully I've tried to reassure you on our limited evidence that women with a risk of VTE can still safely take most types of HRT and certainly body identical HRT. So thank you very much. <laughs>